All right. I can't can't take it any longer. It is time to start. Welcome, everybody. Wonderful to see you all. We're really thrilled uh, to welcome you all to the first session of the 2021 Acadia Science Symposium. This is a chance for the community of science in Acadia to come together, uh, to share ideas, to share questions, to share discoveries, to share perspectives, and, and really to connect. Uh, this is all about science, stewardship, and the future of Acadia National Park. So I'm Nick Fizzichelli. I'm the president and CEO with Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park. Scudic Institute's a nonprofit partner of the National Park Service and a center for inspiring science, learning, and community for a changing world. And uh, our role is really to foster, to facilitate, to connect, and, and to lead scientific research and science communication and science engagement. And, and one of our roles is to, is to push the science to meet stewardship needs. And so today's topic fits with this model and, and is admittedly near and dear to me, the climate adaptation using resist, accept, direct. And that's RAD is the acronym. You're gonna hear RAD being thrown around a lot today, resist, accept, direct. Uh, and then, uh, Examples in Acadia National Park and Bandelier National Monument. When you read that, did you did you think Banda what? Bandelier, really? And at the Acadia Science Symposium, right? What, what what's happening here? And 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 I would say that's right. We're bringing New Mexico up to Maine uh, for this symposium. And and why you may ask? Well, it's to share perspective, uh, of of course. And we know Acadia is changing rapidly. Global change is here. Uh, it's happening today, and, and no surprise, global change is also happening globally. And so there's so much that we can learn from adaptation in other parks and also from a greater diversity of perspectives. And so we've tried to bring both of those uh, aspects to this, this uh, iteration of the Science Symposium. So, and this is really important to our community of science, and so we've invited managers and scientists, uh, including indigenous perspectives from both Acadia and Bandelier to talk about rad climate adaptation. And so you'll hear from Gregor Skierman, who's with the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program. We have Abe Miller Rushing, science coordinator here at Acadia. Darren Ranko from the University of Maine, speaking on Wabanaki perspectives on climate adaptation. Scott McFarland, We'll share examples in Bandelier National Monument. He was the uh, head of resource management there and is now with Natural Sounds and Night Skies. And finally, uh, I believe we'll be hearing uh, Pueblo Perspectives on Climate Adaptation from Kai T. Blue Sky uh, from the uh, Pueblo of Cochiti. And so before we get to that, I should mention the symposium will be moderated by Catherine Schmidt. Catherine is Scudic Institute Science Communication Specialist. And if you've been on a session, with Catherine before, you know that we're all in very good moderator hands today. And, and so next, I want to introduce Kevin Schneider, superintendent here with Acadia National Park. Uh, it's under his leadership and, and his direction and support that the park is utilizing the RAD framework and not shying away from the challenges of managing under continuous change. So Kevin, thanks for joining us and, and thanks for being a RAD leader. <laughs> thanks, Nick. Um, thanks for the nice words. It's great to see everyone. It's great to see such a good turnout today. I know we all miss being in the room together and interacting with one another in person. Hopefully we'll get back there uh, eventually. There's nothing better than being um, at Scudic doing this, doing this symposium. But, you know, the advantage with being together virtually is it allows for people who uh, might not otherwise be able to participate to, to join us. Um, so, so it's great to see, to see folks here from far and wide. I wanna start by recognizing and acknowledging that Acadia National Park sits on the homeland for Maine's four tribes, the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, the Micmac, and the Maliseets. And we are proud to maintain a government to government relationship with them. And it's really great to see indigenous perspectives featured significantly on today's agenda. Uh, it's so appropriate. And we really look forward to, uh, and I as well look forward to hearing those perspectives and, and learning. And we have a lot to learn when it comes to managing this incredible protected area in the face of climate change. To say this is an unprecedented problem is an understatement. 
uh, I am often asked what the biggest threats facing Acadia are. And I have answered that question by saying that undoubtedly the biggest long-term threat to the ecological integrity of Acadia National Park and our nation is climate change. But I've realized in the last six to 12 months that I really need to change my answer um, as this is also the greatest short-term threat to climate change is not something that's gonna happen into the future. It is something that is happening now and it's already having significant effects on, on Acadia and other national parks. For example, we had a major rain event in June that dumped five inches of rain in just a few hours here. And, and so now we have to make uh, decisions about what we do as a result of that storm damage. For example, the carriage roads um, literally had 400 tons of gravel washed into the woods as a result of that storm. One of our cherished historic trails in the park got completely obliterated. And we've got to ask ourselves, does it make sense uh, to rebuild that trail? How do we rebuild it if we do it, uh, rebuild it? You know, incredible stonework and rock work uh, for that trail that was constructed uh, nearly 100 years ago um, that won't be simple to put back together. I was reading this morning about the Park Road in Denali National Park that's being destroyed by landslides that are triggered by thawing permafrost. Now, I've never been to Denali. It's on my life list to go to, but clearly we're seeing uh, the, the effects of a changing climate right now in front of us occurring. And, 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 I, and the RAD framework uh, that we're gonna be talking about more today really poses a very important process to vet and think about how we manage these places into the future. It's not easy. You know, these are cherished places and resources like the Maple Spring Trail or Thunder Hole, for example. These are places that people really, really deeply value. And, and yet we need to make good decisions about how to deal with them in the future. I wasn't trained on how to deal with climate change as a manager when I went to college. I went to college and learned that we're supposed to preserve these parks unimpaired uh, for future generations. And clearly that's our mission. But you know, there was this assumption that things were gonna be stable and we know that's not true today. So we clearly need really high quality science in order to make good decisions uh, now and into the future. And so having conversations like this one, the symposium is so important. We also need scientists who can communicate their results to managers like me uh, and to the broader public and the media. Without good communication, your science, frankly, isn't nearly worth as much because we have to get the word out about this really important work that's happening. Finally, I wanna end by just thanking Nick and Emma Albee for pulling this symposium together, Catherine Schmidt for helping to moderate us today. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the agenda. So uh, Catherine and Nick, I'll hand it back to you to, to take us into the, into the meet. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. I'm Catherine Schmidt. I'm the Science Communication Specialist at Scudic Institute. And I'm just gonna go through a few housekeeping items before we get into the program today. Um, we will be hearing a series of presentations and we won't have a lot of time for discussion. We'll have time for about one or maybe two clarifying question as we transition between presentations. Um, feel free to use the chat, um, but you might wanna hang on to those substantive questions um, until the breakout session. So we will be going into smaller groups um, to really dig into some of the questions that were shared ahead of time with the agenda um, by Emma. And we'll also post those to the chat and I'll give more instructions for the breakout later on. Um, and then we'll come back together after the breakouts and have time for a large group discussion. So we hope you can stay um, for the whole time. Feel free to message me or Emma Albi or Roy Gott, who's under the name Scudic Institute. If you have any technical issues, um, you can message any of us privately and we can address issues or concerns. We are recording today and we will be posting this to Scudic Institute's YouTube channel um, within the next week or so. So um, keep that in mind. Um, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Gregor Skirman. Okay, thank you. I am just sharing my screen now. Give me a second. Setting up the slideshow. 
Okay, well, thank you, Catherine, and everybody else who's played a role in organizing the symposium and for giving me the opportunity to participate. Uh, I want to say, first of all, I'm honored to be around folks from two parks who are really breaking some ground in terms of wrestling with these modern challenges. And I thought the way Kevin set it up, on the one hand, stole a bit of my thunder, which I'm happy for. I can just keep going from there. And on the other hand, is a testimony to a manager really getting it and understanding these challenges and recognizing that climate change is not a long-term threat. It's also a near-term threat. Um, my job here is basically to provide a bit of context on the concept, a uh, little bit of history around it, nature of the challenge, so that the rest of the speakers can build on that and keep going forward and get to their point. I'm gonna speak fairly quickly and try to cover a lot of ground, recognizing that we have breakout and discussion uh, as opportunities to clarify. I'm gonna see if I can drop that, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna jump right in. This is the understanding of the world that a person like me, a middle-aged guy, uh, sort of came up in, in college and grad school, and I think this applies to a lot of people, a recognition that there's dynamism in the world, but that it operates within some kind of familiar bound. So it's not stasis, but it's stationarity. And that's where we get terms like climate envelope or historical range of variability. And this graph here shows a driver of ecosystem or ecological condition, which is temperature, experienced weather, really, and then below it, it shows two ecological systems of differing responsiveness and how they also operate within stationary bounds. Of course, this is what we're getting these days. We're getting non-stationarity where the drivers of ecological condition are operating outside of the bounds as we know them. And increasingly society and the media are recognizing this reality. Ecological condition, of course, uh, responds to changes in drivers, either smoothly like the orange line or with lag times, resilience, resistance, so on, that are eventually exceeded like the blue and, R and uh, purple lines below. When we get enough change in the abundances and the, 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 the composition, the identities of the species that make up a species assemblage in an ecosystem, we can get changes in composition in processes and ecosystem function that are really impactful for humans and the goals we have and the dependencies we have on ecosystems. And so increasingly the term transformation is being used in the literature. Um, that orange line I showed, that smooth tracking of a driver is evidenced here on the East Coast uh, in the conversion of upland forests into ghost forests with salt marsh coming in underneath them. And the more abrupt changes I showed uh, are kind of illustrated by things like the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest this past summer or the SEMA fire in Southern California in an inland example last year. Closer to where I live in Colorado, uh, subalpine forests are now burning, as this uh, science paper says, more than at any time in recent millennia. And just to kind of show you the leaping of the bounds of stationarity here, there's 2,000 years of a pattern within that blue bar. And then you can see that red line in two, in two decades leap way, way, way outside of a two millennium pattern. That's non-stationarity. Consequences of this, are things like fires operating in giant sequoia groves in ways we've never seen, motivating resistance actions like this uh, that nobody would have imagined uh, very long ago and that we wonder about their efficacy. Um, and ultimately this reality challenges the historical natural resource management paradigm. And this quote, let me see if I can drop this box there. Uh, this quote at the bottom from the turn of, turn of the century not long ago really lays it out that if we're managing around a natural range of variability, we're doing the right thing. Let me just get my mouse to work. Okay, and so there in the blue bar is that range of variability. There's a definition. It's ultimately about uh, reference conditions where uh, systems are relatively unaffected by people. Uh, and so there's an understanding that's what, what's in the rear view mirror is, is basically what one can anticipate seeing through the windshield. Consistent with this idea, you get uh, the, the wildlife refuge policy that's anchored around integrity and health and historic conditions, basically the past. The NPS, we often use the past and say we wanna keep things as they were, but technically what we wanna do is keep things natural. That's really our anchor point. Although in the end, it's not that different because the definition of natural that we use is about the absence of human dominance over the landscape, which again is harder and harder to see and make use of. But we need to face this challenge to our paradigm and that's because things are changing as I've shown and managers are facing unavoidable choices. And I'm quickly gonna walk through 
an example from Southern Alaska and some colleagues who I've been working with for a number of years on these challenges, John Morton and Don Magnus. And this refuge, a large refuge, is climatically at the boundary between boreal forest, temperate forest, and grassland and savanna, and has been and is projected to continue to move away from the boreal forest climate space. As a consequence, when disturbances hit their boreal forest these days, most of those disturbances being climate change intensified, what recruits afterwards is a monotypic grassland and not a forest at all. It's something completely unfamiliar. And Don and John and colleagues ask the natural question, can these unnatural uh, changes away from historical condition be reversed or resisted? But when they think about the scale of a change visible from space, when they think about the direction, uh, directionality of climate change, when they recognize inherent ecological uncertainty and they're humble about it all, they're compelled to keep asking questions. What happens if we just accept this trajectory? Where is it headed? Is a depauperate grassland the endpoint or wh what's the trajectory? And then they ask a question, a different one, kind of a newer one. Can we give change a nudge if we can't resist it? Can we do something? Uh, recognizing that the best opportunities are opportunities in the near term and recognizing also that this is a real landscape. This is not an abstract question. Non-federal neighbors are contemplating these kinds of stewardship and management actions and implementing some of them. So what's a manager to do? This is an imperative question. And when folks go to the guidance, at least let's say a handful of years ago, uh, this is what you get. You get an important permission to manage for change and not just for persistence in some of our key uh, guiding uh, documents. But you don't get a lot of detail, and, and that's because paradigm shift takes a while, and it, it wasn't there a few years ago. And so when folks like, like myself in the NPS and my office mate at the time, Nick Fizzichelli, uh, there in 2013-14, were trying to help managers make these unavoidable choices strategically, what we and our colleagues who are actually managing the resource, those of us in, in these agencies managing resources, saw was, yes, the challenges that I've illustrated, but also an overwhelming set of options, frameworks, and concepts, right? Characteristic of a paradigm shift. There's just lots of people uh, tossing out ideas and trying to figure out what works. And here's just a subset of the typologies we had available to us. And uh, we were looking for something that was really manager-centered and as simple and intuitive as possible. And so we looked across these typologies and we looked to one of the earliest ones, really one that had first been proposed in about 2007, a resist accept guide. And uh, here's some of the key, uh, key uh, publications where this was first expressed. And we pulled that down, we made some tweaks, we turned guide into direct because we wanted to give a sense that one might really have to be quite forceful with trying to influence the trajectory. And we messed around with accommodate and instead of, instead of accept, and that's just kind of a little bit of a side trip we did. Uh, we operationalized the concept in a couple of NPS publications uh, that we were working on in 2015, came out in 2016. And ultimately other groups that we began to work with interagency collaborations and beyond, we kind of settled on resist, accept, direct. Very simple framework. Top left is that conventional uh, conservation, resisting. Uh, formalizing the choice to accept is at the top right. And then that nudging or steering is on the bottom right. That's directing. It's very simple, uh, but all of these options are legitimate adaptation. Acceptance can involve simply making no new changes to management in the face of a trajectory that's ongoing, or it can be even backing off of historical approaches. This framework is useful, and we pulled it out of that uh, myriad of, of options because of its focus on manager intent and action, its universality, all of the options are there. Very simple, just three words. It's neutral, doesn't elevate one choice over the other. Supports clear communication, and folks like Scott and Abe will talk about that. Works across time and space. We can get into that in breakouts and it complements other approaches. Ditto for that. I'm gonna just run through a little bit of application quickly and probably drop my last slides. But in a refuge on the, way, on the East Coast, Resistance is happening with thin layer application to help the salt marsh keep up with sea level rise. At the same time, directing is happening to help that same uh, salt marsh expand inward faster than it would. Up in the New York area after Hurricane Sandy, a decision was made to accept a breach in a barrier island and let natural processes respond. I've already shown you resistance from Southern California. This is just last month. And Glacier National Park moving a fish to help them uh, stay within uh, thermal regimes that they need. A native community in northern Minnesota did a groundbreaking managed relocation about 10 years ago to maintain 
ecological services. And finally, I'll just blast through a couple of places where you can learn more about the RAD framework and these links are available, so is this PDF. A couple of new pubs on the right where we rolled out the framework and integrated it with other adaptation approaches. We've got a web page in the NPS now on RAD. We link to the USGS webpage, which has more, including recorded RAD, RAD webinars. We've got a bioscience special section coming out in the next few months that really takes a deep dive on all of this, rather next few weeks. So keep an eye out for that. And many of us are involved in additional trainings and webinars that are in the work, so stay tuned. And with that, thank you for your attention. And I will stop sharing and pass the baton. Thank you, Gregor. That was a whirlwind overview. Um, and as everybody catches up, I think, um, Abe Miller Rushing and Nick Vizichelli are going to share some examples from Acadia National Park. If there are any quick um, clarifying questions, you're welcome to share them in the chat or fairly large 89 people. Um, All right. Nick and Abe, you're up. All right. So uh, my name is Abe Miller Rushing. I'm the science coordinator here at Acadia National Park. And I'm going to start. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to introduce the problem we're facing uh, very quickly and then hand it over to Nick in just a minute uh, to talk about kind of what we're doing about it. Uh, and so Acadia, just to position us, Acadia is near the southern edge of the boreal forest, which is in the dark green. Uh, most of the green uh, of boreal forest that you see on this map to the south of us is confined to montane areas. And so being at the southern edge of the range we're, and given climate change, we're expecting big changes to our forests and other ecosystems. Um, on the next slide, you can see our 10 most common uh, tree species in the park. <clears throat> and uh, you can see red spruce is, accounts for, for the vast majority of our trees, but there are a, a number of other common tree species in the park. And of those 10 tree species, nine are expected to decline or disappear from the park uh, entirely by uh, over the next 80 years or so based on habitat availability. And no matter how this shakes out, how accurate exactly this forecast is, we do expect big changes in our forests. And normally, if you can think of a normal climate change, we would expect uh, native trees from our south, things like oaks and hickories, to move in and replace our boreal forest as it disappears. Um, but temperatures are warming faster than these trees can keep up with. And, um, and we've put lots of obstacles in their way, uh, especially on the East Coast with development, roads, cities, agriculture, and the like. And instead, what we see is several non-native invasive shrubs uh, that are very good at getting here on their own, bypassing all those obstacles um, and expanding their populations and, and choking out native forest regeneration in the region. We're doing a very good job of managing them right now, um, but, but we can't do that necessarily forever. And so this is our big challenge. How do we manage these changes and keep our forests and other ecosystems healthy? Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Nick to to talk about kind of some of the approaches we're taking to science, uh, science that problem. Great, thank you, Abe. And that's quite a photo of all that Japanese barberry in the understory. Everybody has to do a tick check after the symposium because they love to live in those shrub thickets. So, so we wanted really to, to share the, the RAD framework with you today and, and show how we're structuring the scientific research using this framework and, and, and meaningfully informing management. And, and so for the science, this includes observational studies, uh, computer modeling work, and controlled experiments. They all fit actually quite nicely in, in this framework. And I'll share three examples that span RAD, the first two I'll share are experiments related really to, to the directing change end of the spectrum. And the third is research for uh, resisting change. And so the first is focused on the future plant communities and specifically forests. And uh, part of this work is the tree test bed experiment. Uh, and Abe mentioned that computer models show 
this uh, strong potential for a huge change in the forest in, in Acadia. And, and so that's the modeling work. And so now we're experimenting to really to get a better understanding to see which species are going to struggle under emerging conditions and which will thrive. And so under the directing change strategy, we included 10 southern tree species not yet growing in Acadia. So including them as seeds or as bare root uh, seedling stock to get an understanding, better understanding for which species may do well and how would you even introduce them here under that, that directing change strategy. Similarly for uh, the summit areas and, and those uh, vegetation communities in the park, uh, the uh, experiments are happening here by Chris Nadeau, who is uh, was a second century stewardship fellow and now is, is uh, doing his postdoc. He's a Smith Conservation Fellow at Northeastern University. And uh, so he's working on the Cadillac Summit restoration and testing the, the ability of 15 different populations of three-toothed syncophoil to grow on the summit. So for the forest example, we were looking at multiple species. Here for three tooth syncophoil, we're looking at within species. And, and these populations come from other summits with either similar or warmer temperatures as those found today on Cadillac. And Chris is testing whether increasing this within species diversity by bringing in individuals from away uh, improves the restoration of this species. And both of these examples, they're short-term experiments. They're not long-term management treatments uh, as yet. All plants either were or, or will be removed. And if you note where Chris is standing here next to this garden bed, that garden bed is the same one that was in the previous slide here, which also are garden beds that were uh, originally uh, added into the park for research by Caitlin McDonough Mackenzie. These boxes were built by volunteers. And I think it, it just uh, really exemplifies how important science is for management here in Acadia and specifically rad science is really becoming part of the standard operating procedure here. And then the, the last example uh, I want to mention here, we're on the resist end and this idea of potential refugia for Arctic species. And, and here, this is one of my, my all-time favorite plant species, uh, black crowberry, Empetrum nigrum. It, it's found all across the Arctic, uh, up into Canada, Alaska, even in, in Scandinavia. And it's uh, found here along the coast of Maine, a few, diff a few disjunct populations of this species, really at its southern range limit. And some uh, great modeling work was done by Jenny Smetzer, also a former second century stewardship fellow, uh, who took a lot of, actually took citizen science data and other sources of data looking at where black crowberry is found today. And then did some modeling where those conditions will be in the future for this species. So you see the yellows to oranges to purple colors here. These are, are the areas that are potential refugia or future habitat for black crowberry for the end of the century. And so indicating where maybe this species could persist on the landscape and thus these areas may be refugia for the, the species. And, and so it's great modeling work that we are now uh, following up on with the on the ground research. And so building upon the modeling with professional and citizen scientists going out into these refugia areas to see what's happening. Uh, where is crowberry found today? Is it already in these areas that are projected to be refugia? How much is there? And, and how's it doing? How's it health? Is it showing dieback? Is it, uh, is it flowering and fruiting? Uh, what's the status of the species. And, and there are some amazing results from this research that you're going to have to come back at four o'clock today to learn more about what's happening and to hear presentations by the intrepid science technicians uh, here at Scudic Institute who have posters to share on their, their summer research. Uh, here, Hanai Garrison 
and Emily Jackson led some of the refugia research, and uh, I hope you'll come back and check out some of their findings from this. Uh, but this research really, it's about identifying refugia and then inventorying and monitoring what is in those areas, and then based on on, on the science, then determining appropriate management actions, such as removing invasive species, mimicking natural disturbances if, if appropriate, uh, limiting trampling, and, and other actions. And finally, the uh, science communication and engagement are super critical in, to this work, telling the stories, bringing people into the science, and the stewardship, <clears throat> and all the partnerships that are required to make this work happen. And so I just wanna quickly say thank you to partners such as Friends of Acadia, University of Maine, College of the Atlantic, Native Plant Trust, all the Second Century Stewardship Fellows, Cedar Crest College, and, and many others, and, and all the individual supporters of this work as well for science and stewardship in Acadia. Thank you, Nick and Abe. Um, I, um, I did put a link to the poster session in the chat um, and feel free to follow up um, both of you with any other links to your work. Um, and we'll, we'll add to the, if you, if you go to the, um, my timer went off. Uh, if you go to the symposium webpage, we've added some links to the RAD reports and other things, and we'll continue to put resources there as they come up through the day today. Um, so our next speaker is um, Darren Renko. Darren, we're very grateful to have you with us today. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Darren Renko, Neheme Um So I am uh, Darren Renko, I'm a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and chair of Native American programs at the University of Maine. And uh, I'm phoning in from a place in Dedham that we call Turkey Hill, Neheme Benake, a lot of turkeys that run around the hill here. Um, so that's my play, way of orienting myself and I will share my screen um, as well for my slides. Hopefully folks can see that. Um, so I just want to give some Wabanaki perspectives on climate change and the kind of work that's been going on, especially in the last uh, six years or so. Um, this presentation, I have a lot of data here from um, my grad student, uh, Natalie Michelle. Uh, so I just want to give her credit to some of the data that I'll be sharing. The, the work starting in 2015 was um, in a large part funded by a a Bureau of Indian Affairs grant um, led by the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point, Subayak. Um, and so I want to address that work and then look at where we're going. But it's really about building baselines for climate change um, from a Wabanaki perspective and thinking about it uh, adaptation um, um, into the future from with Wabanaki priorities. So uh, one thing to that I frame up is to think about Wabanaki diplomacy as a place and process to think about the scaling of this effort um, across our landscape. Um, kind of ask the question, can this kind of work reflect indigenous community perspectives and values? And talk a little bit about our initial findings and try to think about this from adaptation and action orientations um, as well. So our work is um, very clearly a multi-method approach um, influenced by various forms of participatory research and indigenous research methods, as well as sustainability science. Uh, for us, the key to adaptation is based around community, social and cultural resilience. Uh, I think the, the RAD network also uh, kind of frames that uh, as well in a similar way. The, the community-based uh, research and indigenous research methods also link uh, Wabanaki ecological knowledge and science in Western climate science. Um, it recognizes that our the, the Western uh, climate science exists in and outside uh, our tribal nations. And um, uh, for us, so the Wabanaki uh, ecological knowledge and science 
can teach us what to look for and how to look for what is important as we adapt um, to climatic change. So again, some frames here, Wabanaki diplomacy as a place and a process. Um, our Confederacy is um, hundreds of years old, uh, predates um, the arrival of European settlement in major uh, waves, but also reflects our values in landscape management across the, our, our area uh, as a Confederacy. Um, and it's rooted in our, in our wampum traditions uh, and, and our diplomacy and connecting with other tribal and um, Euro and Euro-American nations. <clears throat> I'm sure this is just a review for everyone, but this is the uh, location of the five tribal governments for, for reservation communities and, and tribal nations in what is now known as Maine. But also there's, a, there's some really important tensions that um, people have to understand in doing this work across our larger Wabanaki territory. Um, the location of the tribes, the, the uh, map doesn't even capture where our lands are in what is now Maine. And it for sure does not capture sort of when we as Wabanaki people think of our landscape collectively, um, that it, it is, it is uh, collectively a place across what is Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Southern Canada, and particularly in the Maritime Provinces. Um, for us, we're connected to the 29 Micmac, six Malisee, one Passamaquoddy bands in, in what is now known as Canada. Uh, so that's Wabanaki diplomacy as a place uh, of action and understanding our climate uh, response. As a process, um, Wabanaki diplomacy is a way um, of engaging in multinational um, protocols and formalized um, relationships uh, in response primarily in, in the, for these past several hundred years to resource issues or how to get along across our landscape. So I think as a process, it's, it's very relevant to our collective work. Uh, the Confederacy itself is an ongoing and shifting uh, idea, but it is very much alive in, uh, on, in our Wabanaki uh, tribal nations across the region. Um, and there are so many protocols that are part of this, but it is really focused on uh, consensus orientations, notions that everyone talks and Passamaquoddy, Sidagwin, Doliwestu, you know, this, these notions of everyone having a seat and, and everyone talking and reaching understanding, of course. For our, the BIA grant, um, this was again working uh, Pleasant Point Environmental Department um, worked, worked this uh, with us. We did some of the social science at, at the University of Maine, um, myself and Natalie, um, and really set up a connection between climate scientists and, and tribal nations in our region to come up with uh, baselines and priorities uh, around climate change threats and adaptation priorities. Uh, this, or, or this ended uh, sort of uh, uh, the collective work in October, 2017. The work has been ongoing in terms of communication and, and building more plans for individual tribal nations. Uh, and it really emphasized the integration of native and Western science and this idea of a collective set of actions and priorities for Wabanaki uh, tribal nations. Um, so in terms of the climate threats, these are, these are uh, you, you know, not surprising to anyone, I think, in our region. Uh, increases in degree days, things like ticks and invasive species, of course, are very important. Um, erosion from increased precipitation, uh, loss of moose is tied, of course, to ticks, uh, and people know that story around here. And other culturally important species, uh, especially around food, hunting activities, and cultural um, engagements on the landscape. Water temperature, of course, uh, impacting fish and fisheries, as well as forest practices, air temperature, again, ticks, invasive species, mosquitoes, um, this potential for a transition in the Northern Maine climate zone, um, as well as, and this was of course very important, the impacts on cultural values and, and for us, why it matters, uh, especially around subsistence and sustenance issues around food, economics, health, and recreation. So in our collective work, we've been really drilling down on climate adaptation priorities. Um, 
it's probably not surviving, but thinking about resilience as our ability to adapt within our own history and cultural traditions. Uh, for one of the things that's come out is like the importance of our language and stories in thinking about where we are resilient, where we can um, find frameworks and, and important insights to how to adapt. Um, what comes up again and again in, in many different ways is around food sovereignty, um, which is, you know, beyond markets and access to food, but is really about uh, engagement around uh, along the on the landscape with our food traditions, healthy food webs, um, connecting to our relationship to fish, uh, diadromous and anadromous fish. Um, also, cultural sites threatened by sea level rise. A lot of indigenous um, nations uh, across North America uh, are really prioritizing this as well. Other cultural resources that will be impacted, their range and our access to them, things like brown ash, cedar, spruce, um, sweet grass, maple, and, and uh, previous speakers kind of talk, talked about a few of those. Work to protect water quality and quantity. And again, back to um, uh, food and healthy uh, soil and for food in terms of the access points. So again, the priorities, you know, just really thinking about uh, how we can work collectively uh, as, as Wabanaki nations uh, in developing a, a broader adaptation plan, but also one that is um, um, for each tribal nation uh, and community seeing what is common among all of us and really working on food security. Some of the ideas around that is um, creating food security networks across the Wabanaki tribal nations um, as we uh, face adaptation issues, share knowledge, uh, of course, across the communities with a commitment to the use of technology, work to leverage our confederacy to help one another, uh, educate um, tribal leadership and membership around uh, climate adaptation issues through the use of hands-on projects and really engaging the children. Uh, and also really mobilize a notion of an integrated community planning. Um, our governments, just like other governments, uh, segment and, and silo kind of the things that should be working together around uh, protecting uh, resources uh, through uh, intensive climate uh, change. Um, so, you know, one thing I want to share in terms of conclusion is that uh, at the University of Maine and here in the Wabanaki Center Native Programs, we will be taking a lead for tribal engagement in the Northeast Climate uh, Adaptation Science Center region, any cask, um, that we really are looking to, to link Indigenous uh, place and processes into this work and into the any cask uh, uh, region and um, really think about tribal participation in the policy context. Uh, I don't think that's been uh, satisfactory up to this point. Um, and really thinking about you know, who changes and how you change and just sort of reclaiming our space as, as Wabanaki people across this broader landscape will be a critical part of our action. And I will stop sharing there. I went 10 and a half minutes, my apologies. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Darren. back to you, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Um, and just to, to follow up as um, Scott's coming on, um, the NE CASC is the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and so they have their science meeting next week. Are you pre presenting yeah. or is that work going to start in January? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be presenting and, and kind of doing a build up. Um, there are various sort of starting points to it, but in terms of the real action it will be in January. I think officially we started kind of in the leadership pieces on October 1st. Thank you. Um, okay, Scott McFarland. We're gonna move Thanks, over to the and, Western uh, US now. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? I was having some microphone issues a minute ago, but. Yes, sounds okay. good. And just to confirm, Kai T was unable to join us. Is that correct? Let him weigh in if he happens to be on here. Okay, uh, that's unfortunate. I'll try to cover a little bit for, for Kai T here. Um, let's see.
All right, is that coming through okay? Yes. Great. All right, so I'm Scott McFarland. I'm the field program lead with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division uh, based out of Fort Collins, Colorado. And previously, I was the Chief of Resource Management at Bandelier National Monument. So Bandelier, just real quickly, is uh, located in northern New Mexico. Uh, it was one of the earliest monuments established in 1916. Uh, ranges in elevation from 5,000 to 10,000 feet. So it's kind of this great lab um, to look at uh, climate change impacts and drought and fire um, across an elevation gradient. Uh, Bandelier uh, benefits a lot from science that's been done uh, from uh, numerous partners, including the USGS. Uh, this map shows uh, dated fire scars uh, in the park and surrounding area. And basically what I'm trying to convey here is that the landscape is very fire adapted with a, a natural return interval for fire uh, anywhere from five to 20 years, depending on the elevation. So fire was a, a reoccurring, uh, really critical part of the landscape. Uh, but unfortunately in the late 1800s, um, we started uh, releasing sheep and cattle uh, throughout the mountains. Um, they grazed down basically all of the, uh, grasslands uh, that were in the forest and stopped uh, the natural fire regime. Um, coupled with uh, previous land management policy um, of basically suppressing every single fire um, that ever occurred. Uh, fire was the enemy um, and not viewed as part of the natural uh, environment. Unfortunately, uh, that led up to a lot of buildup of fuels and Eventually, we could no longer fight these fires, and we're seeing that across the West. This is a story um, not just applicable to Bandelier, um, but it shows up in uh, locations throughout the world. Uh, there's lots of history there, um, but kind of the, the big event um, that's most well known is the Lost Conscious Fire in 2011. Uh, burned over 140,000 acres. Um, including 66% of Bandelier National Monument, uh, much of it with high severity. Um, so you can see the, the cloud there from the fire um, that eventually actually collapsed and then made the fire spread even more. And then you can see the impacts on the landscape. Uh, it went from a ponderoso or a mixed conifer forest, uh, was type converted uh, essentially to a wasteland. Uh, the hydrophobic soil um, really, uh, Kind of a, a persisting change on the landscape. Um, the other thing that happened was a lot of floods after that fire. Um, in 2013, the largest flood occurred uh, where a creek that normally flows at 10 CFS uh, or maybe even down to a 2 CFS was flowing at 9,000 CFS. Um, from these disturbance events though was we, we had some opportunities that were created. And get into a little bit of those opportunities, but first we had a lot of science um, to, to back up um, deciding to intervene in the landscape. Um, and we knew that we had a very short window to act. So some of the science that was coming out um, indicated that we had less than 10 years to get seedlings in the ground uh, before climate conditions would get too hot, too dry uh, to be able to even have seedlings survive. So adult trees can handle um, much worse conditions um, but they were not reproducing on the landscape. So a little bit more on that. Um, we also had some good climatic uh, suitability indications, our studies done, uh, basically showing that the, the ecosystems were going to shift up in elevation. Um, so where we may have had um, a ponderosa forest before, um, by 2040, that was likely to become a pinyon juniper forest. Um, and for the, the mixed conifer, uh, that was more than likely going to become um, a, a pinyon kind of ponderosa mix. One thing I do want to touch on is that um, while science is really important in making management decisions, it's not the only aspect of making those choices. Uh, there's risk involved in these decisions, and we don't know everything. Um, and it's also really important to um, manage the landscape for the people that utilize it. Uh, including, uh, so Kai T is down there in the lower corner. I uh, wish he would have been able to join. Kai T is a member of the Cochiti Pueblo 
Uh, there are over 22 tribes affiliated with Bandelier, um, six of which are very closely tied, uh, including Cochiti Pueblo. Um, what's great about Bandelier is it's been continuously occupied for over 10,000 years, and the direct descendants of the ancestral Puebloans for which the monument is famous uh, still live in the surrounding area. They still utilize the landscape for their traditional cultural practices. Uh, it's still used for ceremonies. It's a very uh, important part of the Pueblo people. And then there's also a town site of Los Alamos, relatively small, it's where the Manhattan Project occurred. Um, and there's folks that live there that also went through this um, loss of their forest. So taking their perspective into account uh, was really critical for making our decisions. So after the 2011 uh, fire, uh, Bandelier kind of turned into an accept um, model. Uh, for over eight years, there was really no restoration work um, done in the park. And I showed up uh, 2017 and looked at the landscape, looked at the needs of the, the Pueblo people and the Los Alamos community, um, as well as the trajectories of where we were going and future conditions, and decided that um, while we did have to accept it across the landscape because of financial um, burdens, um, we didn't have to accept it everywhere. And maybe we could, we could you know, take some actions. So the first um, thing we did was kind of in the uh, resist uh, frame there, where you know, the Pueblo people and the Los Alamos folks um, really deemed these impacts unacceptable. So the Lost Conscious Fire was a human-caused fire from a downed power line. Um, it was so intense and so big because of um, human-caused conditions on the ground, including climate change. And particularly from the Pueblo people, I heard time and time again that these impacts are not okay. Uh, we're not going anywhere. And we still really rely on this landscape. So do whatever you can uh, to fight these impacts. So one of the ways uh, we could fight drought was by releasing uh, beaver, which had been extirpated from the park for over 60 years. Uh, then it got a little more challenging where we got to um, kind of the direct side of things where we looked at this lost conscious burn scar. Um, we knew what future conditions were going to be and we needed to kind of direct um, where that landscape was going. The other confounding issue was that this much of uh, Bandelier is in designated wilderness. So there's not a lot of projects, particularly out there in the National Park Service, um, where folks are doing restoration work, um, let alone adaptation type of work in designated wilderness. So just an example here um, of, of how we went through our decision-making process. This is Upper Frijoles Canyon in Bandelier. Um, immediately after the fire, um, pretty devastated landscape. A year later, you can see on kind of a north facing slope there, uh, has been type converted from a, a mixed conifer forest to a shrubland. And in other places in the park where there had been previous fires, it had been type converted from a mixed conifer to a shrubland to a grassland. Um, so pretty extensive changes very rapidly. Um, this is a, a quote that I, I absolutely love um, and really a paradigm shift in how land managers, uh, particularly in the West um, and in Northern latitudes need to be thinking about um, managing these landscapes and, and with the eye towards you know, future conditions. Um, it's not looking good uh, and we need to take actions now or we may run out of time. So in Bandelier, uh, we decided to replant um, in pockets where we thought there was the best chance of having forests into the future. So these are just a few examples uh, of the locations we decided to plant in. Uh, one of the big limitations is, is financial, of course. Uh, we were able to secure a $500,000 grant to purchase about 100,000 trees, which sounds like a lot, but when you start putting them on the landscape, it's not that many. Um, so we targeted areas on north facing slopes or drainages where we thought the conditions um, may be favorable in the future uh, to having at least some mixed conifer or ponderosa forests um, persist into the future. And we are also uh, planting on the margins of where uh, of the elevation uh, where those trees currently exist. So kind of moving ponderosa um, 
to be a little bit more dominant into the mixed conifer, moving pinion pine um, up into the ponderosa forest um, with the idea that eventually those will become more dominant. So kind of kickstarting that process, um, but not completely going in and you know taking um, juniper from Mexico and planting them in here. So just kind of nudging it and giving it a, a best chance moving forward. A um, little bit more detail on here. Uh, we named each of these plot sites um, within each of these areas. Um, you know, identified areas where we were going to plant really dense and areas where we were going to plant sparse. Um, under historic conditions, to naturally refill in the uh, lost conscious burn scar, we've taken over 2,000 years um, and we're not in historic conditions. So basically, it would never happen. Um, so we're hoping that um, these. These plots can serve as a seed source um, to hopefully refill in um, in some locations, as well as serve the you know, cultural needs of the Pueblo people and the folks in Los Alamos um, to get out, enjoy these landscapes, utilize Doug Fir for cultural uh, ceremonies, those types of things. Uh, just a little bit more detail on you know, this process. This was pretty complicated. So we, we did a lot of um, you know, mapping and, and looking at every single spot, um, how big the uh, gap in trees were. So were there any trees that survived uh, the fire in areas that were huge? Uh, how many plots did we need to refill that in? Um, how much uh, space did we need between those plots? So a future fire wouldn't just wipe them all out, all those types of things. Uh, this is a, just a little more detailed view. Um, so we were planting really high density, but in really um, kind of small areas in the landscape. And again, this is with an eye towards, these are the areas that have the highest amount of moisture. Um, they have the most shade. Uh, they may be protected from elk, which are a, a major issue with replanting um, and can hopefully serve as a seed source going forward. And just a, a little photo there of kind of what that looked like. Uh, so again, a lot of it's designated wilderness. This is, I think, 3,000 of the trees. Um, and a lot of this ended up having to be backpacked in. Um, so pretty slow process. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, in the future that people can still enjoy these forests. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you to all of our um, speakers. The chat's been fairly quiet, so I'm guessing that everyone is saving their questions and comments for the smaller group um, sessions. Um, so we have about, uh, you'll be in your small groups um, for less than 20 minutes. Um, and so just some guidance, we will post the um, prompt questions to the chat and you should have access to those from your breakout groups. Um, we, are, we suggest that once you're in your group that you designate someone to be a recorder and someone to be a facilitator to help you work through the questions if you want to. We also suggest that every, you, your first step is to just um, introduce yourselves to one another and then discuss these um, questions that we've shared in the prompt. The questions were also um, on the agenda that Emma emailed um, with the Zoom link for your registration um, because we really are interested in your discussion. We're interested in the questions. We're interested in the comments that people have and we're gonna be using this information. Um, and so we want you to, the designated recorder um, send if you send your notes keep your notes however it's easiest for you and you can send them um, to Emma when you're finished so you don't need to um, have them wrapped up today but at some point um, if you could just email whatever notes you've taken from your breakouts to Emma I'll be um, and that's the email who um, Emma sent again the zoom link in the agenda so you all should have her email um, and then when we come back together, um, post any outstanding questions that your group might have had that you think the whole group could benefit from. Go ahead and post those um, into the chat. And we're going to start the large discussion um, with, the, with our speakers and sort of have some questions for them. They may have questions for one another. And then we'll bring in um, questions from all of you. So that's how. Um, 
the next hour is going to run. Um, really glad to have you all here. And again, we're really anxious for your input. Um, so um, please do participate in the small groups. And I think Roy um, is going to um, send you to your breakout groups. You ready, Roy? How's the weather in Fort Collins? Very nice right now. Um, high 60s, nice clear air. Contrast with the summer when we get a lot of smoke from the west. Are we getting the weather report from Fort Collins? That's right, Nick. It's uh, it's sunny and dry, just like you like it. <laughs> Have you guys had a frost yet in Fort Collins? Yeah, we had one. It was terrible. <laughs> I like summer. Nick We've not summer. gotten any frost. Yes, okay. here it's been crazy. Wow. It's been crazy warm this fall here. No frost yet. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, the, that time always goes by so fast, and we had um, uh, Katie got cut off in our session. So I will get back to your question, Katie. Um, but I want to give um, our speakers a chance to ask questions. Of one another, and then I and then I have a couple of questions. Um, and in the meantime, if there were sort of outstanding or big questions, if you want to go from the small groups, um, if you want to go ahead and put those in the chat, that would be great. Um, but um, Abe, Nick, Gregor, Scott, Darren, any? I, I've got for each one other. If I I got yeah. one if I can just toss it out. I was mentioning it in the breakout group. It's really a prompt for Scott. Now the theme here is to be strategic in resisting, accepting, or directing, to know why you're doing it, to be able to show your work and to be able to show that you've been you've thought long term and maybe across space and that this action makes sense. And once you kind of get that orientation, there's some room for some real creativity here. And one of the things that I was really impressed with uh, in a different conversation I had with Scott is their use of these ahistorical floods to uh, power fish restoration. And so I, I'll just mute out and ask Scott to maybe just talk about that for a minute because it's a nice example of really using a disturbance that shouldn't be happening to foster a long-term goal. Yeah, that's a, a good point, Gregor. Uh, there's a lot of strategy um, behind these decisions. It's one of the questions that came up in our breakout group both. What about the uncertainty? What if somebody comes in and removes all your work? Well, the first thing we did, and I didn't mention it in my presentation, was actually restore Rio Grande cutthroat um, to Frijoles Creek. Um, they had been extirpated for over 100 years out of that creek um, just due to stocking of rainbow and Yellowstone cutthroat. And I was very strategic in making that decision um, because folks are interested in fish. Um, fish brings money and it brings attention. And we also had this big disturbance event. So the lost conscious fire was, was horrible, um, but it opened up some opportunities to take some actions. So prior to my coming there, it opened up habitat for bighorn sheep. So bighorn sheep were released um, in the park. We're just outside of the park and we're doing awesome. Um, whereas when there was you know, a high density forest, um, kind of non-natural conditions, uh, they couldn't survive in that location. And then, so when I got there, um, looked at this creek, uh, which was now devoid of fish because that flood took them all out, uh, which normally you'd have to use rhodonone and poison and go through an environmental assessment and do all these things. Uh, well, now we had this opportunity where we could get native cutthroat, um, which are better adapted to hotter, drier conditions and also draw attention to the park and hopefully get some funding to roll into some of the bigger projects like riparian zone restoration and upland forest restoration. So we got the Rio Grande cutthroat in uh, within, I think, six months of, <laughs> of my getting there. A super fast, easy process. Um, drew a lot of attention. We had a ton of volunteers show up. Um, we had, uh, you know, Coach D and other Pueblo uh, kids come out from the Santa Fe Indian School uh, to do the release and got a lot of attention, got in the news, was able to then roll that into uh, getting beaver uh, rolling. Uh, so we got beaver in the landscape within a year. Um, more attention, of course, in the area. Then we got 20,000 trees just with a small purchase. And then we rolled that into being able to get a grant to purchase 100,000 trees. So there's kind of an order of things. But once you kind of kick that um, rock rolling down the hill, it 
takes on its own momentum and you start to, to get interest from all over the place and, and you know to be honest finances um, to be able to do this stuff so hopefully that that helps Scott do you have questions for any of the your fellow speakers hmm well, I talked to Gregor uh, probably too often, so that's, um, <laughs> you know, I'd be curious, um, kick this to anybody in Acadia, um, you know, are you guys seeing kind of increased you know, potential for large scale wildfire or that kind of thing? Um, you know, I was at, at Great Smoky um, when that big fire uh, ripped through Gatlinburg um, in areas where there was no fire history for over 800 years. Um, so it was interesting to see kind of those conditions start to play out in the eastern um, area, and you know I'm a, a western kid at heart, and that's most of my land management experience as well. So, just curious whether that's showing up at Acadia. Um, so here, I I would say fire is not a, a big part of the landscape. We had a we had a 1940 we had a fire in 1947. Um, but we that did burn what like a third of Mount Desert Island, which is the majority of where Acadia National Park is. Um, but otherwise, you know, the fire return interval here is very long, and uh, and we're actually getting wetter. Um, there is the possibility of having droughty droughtier conditions. So that's a that's a question you know we have. But um, but it doesn't you know I think we're much more concerned with storm damage and, and wind throw and 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 invasive and and trees dying from invasive insect pests and things like that those are the much more likely and much more immediate um kind of disturbance drivers that we're dealing with right now here rather than fire i guess layering on that um so you're kind of looking towards the hotter weather scenario which was um <laughs> one of the potential options at bandelier but um, is there a change in the type of precip at Acadia? Like, are you going to experience less snowfall and just more rain or the seasonality as well? Yeah. Do you, do you want to take that, Nick? Or do you want, do you want me to do that too? Go ahead, Abe. All right. Um, so we're, we are expecting, yes, changes in the types of rainfall for sure that, uh, that we're getting bigger rainstorms. Uh, we're getting less snow in the winter and um, and more more rain in the winter and and what that leads to is is a lot of more flooding. Uh, Kevin alluded to that um, uh, in his talk or, or in his welcoming remarks that we had like a four inches fall in in three hours um, that led to a bunch of washouts and and some of our big rainfall events in the winter they freeze very rapid, like we can get big rain on snow events and then, and then rapid freezing afterwards, which causes a lot of infrastructure damage from all these kind of big rainfall events. Um, and so that is a, how to adapt our infrastructure and how do we, you know, a big problem we're thinking about right now in, in our RAD thinking is, is how, you know, how do we do our stream restorations um, after these big washouts that have just totally changed our, you know, stream uh, structure, like, and the, the channels, and now they're full up of, of boulders. Um, so, uh, so what do we, what do we do about that? And how do we make those decisions? Um, in addition to what, what do we do about our trails, rehab, rehabilitating our trails and other things, um, thinking about, about how they're going to perform going forward as, as these storms become more common. These are these are really challenging challenging decisions that we're. <laughs> I'm, I think it'll become more. We'll be get you more used to how to work our way through these decisions. But for, at the moment, it's, it's still a trick to work our work through. You know, and from a, a vegetation a, a vegetation perspective, the as they've said, it's been getting wetter. But with the warming temperatures, we've been seeing both heavier rain events but drier conditions as well and that, that tree test bed study I shared, the three summers of that study were really droughty, so 2017, 18, 19. And we saw a huge amount of mortality of seedlings in that study. And so 
rather than really seeing a strong temperature response by seedlings, it was all about soil moisture. And even here in the Northeast, this, this temperate wet area, uh, we, we really saw that dry conditions were, were an impact uh, due to the really hot, hot temperatures of those summers. Catherine, I have a question, unless you want to go. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question, so go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, so, I mean, what I think is um, really interesting, and I, and, you know, I just really noticed this in the in the different framings that um, Acadia had versus uh, Bandelier in terms of Indigenous partners. Um, and it strikes me that the, you know, the some of the creativity that Gregor uh, mentioned with RAD is, um, has to do with as much about creativity as as values of like what to you know adapt and direct and sort of how does that work and 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 finding guidance and values with indigenous partners and I wondered you know if you could reflect on that um, Nick and Abe like it, it strikes me that that wasn't a framing that you all used uh, of course I used it <laughs> as a sort of general uh, sense of our landscape but. Um, you know, it strikes me this is a real like the partnership helps direct with indigenous peoples and values uh, that kind of creativity and and Gregor also referenced and we talked about this well I talked about this in my, our group. Um, he referenced I believe the example he was referencing I don't think he named it was the Grand Portage Band of like Superior Chippewa shifting the management of, uh, of a fishery from a cold uh, brook trout fishery to a cooler water fishery with yellow perch and walleye like so like using indigenous values and kind of concepts to kind of guide the 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 decisions and, and creativity around this um strikes me as something that is like a missed opportunity with Acadia I didn't know if you guys had thought about that Abe or or, or yeah uh, I can uh, I can answer and then and Rebecca Cowell can also chime in um on answering this uh so yes, we are definitely thinking about it and and try taking taking action slowly. So the biggest project that we have right now that's that's related to climate, that's tangentially related to climate change adaptation, uh, in partnership with the Wabanaki is the what sweetgrass restoration or sweetgrass harvesting, and so that's been going on I think for about four or five years. Um, and and for those of you who don't know, sweetgrass is a salt marsh plant that's used in, in traditional basket making, and um, and so we've been, and there's a relatively recent policy shift within the Park Service that allows, um, that gives us a way to allow and, and work with tribes uh, on traditional harvesting of, uh, of culturally important plants. Um, and so we've been working with the, um, with uh, Suzanne Greenlaw and, and other harvesters as a, as a part of that process for uh, several years now, and I, I think that that's going well. And I think that uh, we have been struggling, I would say, to exactly figure out the proper way to engage uh, the tribes on on the 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 rest, some other parts of the restoration. But we are working at it, um, and I think it's a matter of building, you know. Just having those discussions, and so we're we're definitely working at it, and and want, and definitely, are are aiming to to build that as a part of our plans for for going forward. Um, we're, we're right now most of that work is, has been around the sweetgrass harvesting. Rebecca, do you want to chime in on that at all? To maybe Nick, did you want to add anything? Uh, oh, there's Rebecca. I'll, I'll, oh, here, here's Rebecca. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say, Darren, thank you for setting up that good question for us. <laughs> because uh, um, I, uh, some of the work that we're doing follows a lot of the framing that Darren has created for trying to understand how to move forward in a really collaborative way. Um, Two things I would say about this work is that um, I think what we're really trying to do is to reframe um, who makes decisions and how uh, co-governance works in, in some of this decision-making framework. And 
So the, the sweetgrass harvesting project is, is a small one that is moving ahead primarily around um, providing that um, shared knowledge and the decision-making with the gatherers and the advisory group. And also um, that it's really all about um, reconnecting access and a knowledge and land rights for Wabanaki people. It's the, the permitting for gathering grass is really kind of a really small piece of the work. The work's really around reclaiming access um, and, and shared governance in these spaces. And then the other piece is the you know, applying, uh, honestly applying indigenous knowledge as the decision-making kind of framework for a lot of the work. And not only with the gathering project, but with uh, uh, the work that Dr. Bonnie Newsom at the University of Maine is doing around applying indigenous knowledge to understanding climate change and uh, ancestral Wabanaki archeological sites. So it's all really exciting work. Um, and, uh, and like I said, a lot of it's being framed by the language that, that Darren presented to us today. So sh shout out to Darren Ranko. Well, so I was gonna, ask, what I was gonna ask Darren of you was, we're having a lot of discussion about, these are decisions that are being made, right? And decisions are made by people and so much in, in science. And then when we communicate about science, we talk about science informing decisions and decision makers being an audience. And like, this is what, this is what that looks like. These are decisions that are being talked about. And so I was wondering from you, and maybe we want Scott to talk about how, how this has worked at Vandalier instead, but like, what is that, where does that decision happen and who is there? Right. And like, how does that, you know, uh, so Darren, I was curious into your reaction of like, you're hearing about all of these decisions yeah. and not hearing about Wabanaki's part of them. And so like, how does that work? Where is the table? You know, when does it yeah. meet that kind of stuff? And, and maybe we can turn to Scott. No, no, I, I, I think that's it. I think that's why, why I was struck by the sort of bandolier framing it, their mission and their interpretive mission, much more oriented towards uh, tribal, landscapes and histories and I think because that doesn't quite exist with Acadia like it's not just like oh we need the right I mean we do need a better <laughs> uh, set of pieces of engagement and I have ideas on that you know, as, as, as Becky knows I have lots of ideas about a lot of things um, but the idea that, that the interpretive framework itself prioritizing and and I think you can look up at, at what's happening at Katahdin Woods and Waters there's a really different deliberative um, interpretive framework that I think would lead us in this direction and then I would say and I know you guys get hemmed in all the time like is this science or policy or whatever and your politics are pretty bad and I understand that I work at a university but I would just say like the the notion that we should have a as a, a Wabanaki decision making, like a Wabanaki scientific advisory group. Meaning, I know we get put into this role as the social kind of cultural frames, which don't have as much weight in in park uh, frameworks. We, we should be the scientists making these decisions, and actually, that's where and I, I you know I, that's why I like what Gregor presented with Rad is that it's. It's um, it, it then there's the creativity. There's the the options for reframes around uh, management that are yeah you know, outside of some boxes that are we I think the politics and and the science kind of hem us into and the policy. So I would just sort of that's my institution. So if if um, if anyone wants to bring that back to your <laughs> leadership uh, in the park. A Wabanaki science advisory with decision making authority over these sort of future climate, you know, orientation strike me as the right mix. See, I have ideas. I don't know how plausible that is. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> right. Gregor or Scott. Darren, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Nick. Um, Gregor, why don't you go first and, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll try real quick and just say two things. Um, one is 
maybe beyond Nick, pass the baton to Scott to maybe talk about the influence of the Pueblos in that transjurisdictional landscape as not just another player, but in many cases, the motivating uh, player. Um, and getting outside of feds to feds conversations and saying, hey, there's a larger world and let's get moving. So that's one thing. The other thing I'll just drop in there quickly is that um, I sort of like to decenter RAD a little bit when we have indigenous partners and start with the challenge of transforming systems under the influence of uh, post industrial humanity. Um, and I present RAD as sort of a nice tool that mostly we feds and some friends have been messing with to get out of a jam of sort of late 20th century conservation paradigm, uh, recognizing that that's right, that's a certain paradigm with a certain community that works within it and that there are longstanding other ways of thinking about stewardship. And so kind of leaving the space even now for folks like Darren, it's a pity Kai T couldn't make the call to say, all right, We've got this challenge with our paradigm. We find this tool useful. Don't really know if it works in your paradigm or not. We think it's pretty lowest common denominator, but just put it out there and let, let's see where that goes. We do know we're all in the bucket of dealing with transforming systems. And uh, I think there's a lot of room for dialogue and learning. And all of this paradigm shift, which is the framing I use, is we're just groping and trying to find what works and uh, discarding what doesn't or refining it. and. Uh, all this interaction is really, really helpful in, in figuring out what fits where. So I'll stop there and, and uh, mute. Nick. Yeah, I'd like to pass it over to, to Scott. Yeah, I'll touch on it a little bit. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for the Pueblo people, because uh, certainly I'm not Pueblo. <laughs> um, you know, I think at Bandelier, we had a number of good things going for us. Um, number one is that just the culture of that park. Um, there are these boxes, there's a cultural program and there's a natural resource program. And there's two separate programs, but the reality is they're integrated. Um, and cultural resources and natural resources are one and the same um, at that park. Um, and, you know, fortunately, my own perspective on kind of resource management um, plays into that same role. I grew up in Montana. Uh, you know, a number of my friends growing up were um, associated with indigenous tribes uh, from that location. Um, in just my own personal perspective is those voices really mattered. Um, they've been there forever. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a, a student of kind of the history of North America, um, have always loved that stuff, um, have followed it really closely. Um, growing up in Montana, you know, you follow Lewis and Clark, you learn all these things. Um, and then, I, you know, back of my mind in resource management is always a shifting baseline and how much of our current decision making is based off of knowledge that um, you know may not be super accurate i'm kind of eternally skeptic um, so for me the the best resources to tap into were the people that were there for thousands of years um, and are also going to be there into the future um, i think as land managers you know there's a lot of turnover um, i was only there for a few years um, moved on um, Kai T, his whole family is there. Um, he's with Coach de Pueblo. Um, you can hike out into the backcountry there and, you know, find, um, you know, the sites his ancestors uh, were there uh, thousands of years ago. So it's that connection is is really right in your face there. Um, yeah, there's Kai T. Hey, Kai T. <laughs> I'll let Kai T speak to that, actually, since he's able to join us. Hey, Kai T, we're covering kind of the, you know, Coach D perspectives on, you know, the landscape management stuff that we were doing and climate adaptation um, at, at Bandelier. So um, key it up for you, but I'd love to hear from you. You're on mute. Uh, I'm ready to go. If you, shall I, do you want me to turn on my, share my screen? Sure. Yes. Okay. Go for it. Welcome. Okay. All right. Good evening, good people. It's an honor to be able to be here and share with y'all. I can get my screen going, here we go. Okay, so here we go. Move this out of the way so I can get that. Okay, welcome, good people. And so I'll start the story here as we're, thank you for the introduction. I apologize as I'm walking in, Scott. And so this is a, 
This is the southern end of what Scott was talking about earlier. Celeste, can you close the door? Can you close the door? So this is uh, the area of Coach T, just adjacent to uh, where Scott was talking about before. And so I'll, I'll move full. This is Coach T. This is below, uh, this is right below Bandelier National Monument. And this is Coach T in the early, I believe, 1935. And so I wanted just to take a snapshot in time to look at the agricultural world of what it was before Koshi Dam was involved. Um, I bring this photo as a way to talk about the fundamentals of uh, a perspective and philosophy of worldview uh, that permeates from uh, our grandpa's and grandma's knowledge and the foundations of looking at the world as having a spirit and a soul and this is a step beyond uh, having looking at the world through the lens of uh, capitalization. And so looking at the world through capitalization, then you can see the commodification of the world around us. But that's, a, that's not the same as grandma's and grandpa's vision of the world. Uh, when I was working at Coach T, I was working at Hazardous Fuels and we're working on wildland urban interface or, uh, and as well as a non-urban wildland interface. But it was looking not it was not looking for ecological restoration to a time period, but it, what we was looking for was uh, looking for biodiversity. And so we did change and we did manipulate the habitat, and we did change the the biodiversity that occurred there. Like the elk really didn't they really loved the thick stuff, but they didn't like the the clearing out. So the picture on the left that's where the, all the elk were at. But as soon as we uh, cleared out the vegetation. We had uh, the forbs and grasses come back, and then we had deer, and then we had a whole, a whole new slew of uh, birds that came through. And so we're looking at forest restoration, and I know I'm probably pre uh, preaching the choir here, but these, uh, these uh, common goals and common aspirations of reducing fire, uh, wildfire threats, removing stands, was the same that Scott was interested in for Bandelier. And so this was uh, another, um, motor, if you will, for us to be able to begin to visualize a partnership and collaboration. Um, when I came on board at Coach T, I wanted to make sure that language and culture was on the ground foundation. So the projects also had uh, uh, the names in our language. And legacy projects, well, those were legacy, those are projects I was trying to close out and make sure that we started a new abreast, but it was, it was now looking to the larger, larger scale, if you will, the landscape scale, the watershed scale, and no longer looking at the boundaries within our tiny jurisdictions, but envisioning how can we cooperate and partner with um, Forest Service, with National Park Service, with BLM, with Bureau of Reclamation, um, looking at all the entities that surround Coach T. So this is a, a golf course. This is a non-urban WUI. And so the, what, we're, what, I'm, I guess what I'm interested in showing is this scar on this top part. This is where Cerro Grande came onto Coach T. And so you know, in, in the past, it was not of a common scene for a wildfire to travel across a Pino Juniper savanna, but it did occur here with the past three fires. And so we've seen the Cerro Grande, the Los Conchas, and the Dome Fire, 96. These are urban wildland urban interface that we conducted at Coach T, right below Coach T in the Bolski. And so these were beginning the footprint for how we can start engaging the river system. And so being the principles of river flow, water flow, sediment, um, as well as uh, overstory and cover story were all the same principles. And so whether you're looking at the drainage off the roof of your house, whether you're looking at Frijoles Canyon, whether you're looking at the Santa Fe River, or even the Rio Grande itself from the top, from Colorado and down to Mexico, the principles of watersheds are very similar. And so it was not just a, um, developing a watershed restoration, but we're now looking of how to include wildlife but also, you know, so when you get a wildlife biologist doing hazardous fields, you'll get this kind of map going because I was no longer just doing hazardous fuels. What I was doing was creating mule deer habitat. And so it was not enough to have a saw crew just to do wild and urban interface to, to uh, 
stop the possibility of a catastrophic wildfire, but I wanted to uh, exact or explore avenues for training, viable, incredible training with Santa Fe County, with Bureau of Indian, Bureau of Indian Affairs, with uh, Forest Service, with BLM, because we're all following the same management fire book. And so the training, I just wanted to get credible and viable training for our staff. And so that we could start in, uh, looking forward to creating a hazardous uh, sorry, uh, wildland urban into a wildland fire initial attack group. And so this was us uh, teaming up with um, Santa Fe County. And so they provided a, a vast majority of our training, but we also did our training with BLM as well as National Park Service. And so it, this is where Scott and I started seeing uh, commonalities in our goals and aspirations for uh, doing a landscape scale, but doing also doing an initial attack. Um, and so it was one for let's attain, let's attain training and gain that certification. Let's get all get red carded. And, but not let's not all get red carded, but let's start building our fire crew. And so we needed a engine boss. So we started sending out our individuals on uh, fires, whether it be in Oregon or Montana. And so we send out one individual on a training. They come back more certified and qualified. Then we send out the next individual. So that's how we were working our training for our staff. And so then I started seeing the ability of dovetailing National, uh, National Park Service Forest Service because that's north, that's our boundaries that's our that's our native coaches neighbors to the north, and so we started looking for a, a 300 gallon type uh, type six engine to do initial attack. We we're also doing uh, we're also working with uh, BIA at that time, but we we're also doing search and rescue on Coach TN where we always found people who were getting lost in the backcountry whether they're coming from Bandelier or walking from Coach Lake watch, walking north. But in, in several instances, uh, we were the ones who found the individuals were lost. So search and rescue was also on our table. This was reflecting back to wildfires and it's not a matter of if wildfires are gonna come through, it's when. Uh, we've seen a number of wildfires that went over the same landscape of Coach T. And, and, and I'll remind you, Coach T is 12 miles downstream from Los Alamos National Laboratories, which manufactures nuclear weapons. And so there's byproducts, right? And so this is a, a one snapshot of a story to talk about the contamination in Los Alamos that evidently ends up in Koshi Lake. And that's a whole nother story and we'll leave that for another time. But just to frame the idea or frame the location of where we're talking about. So this is a map showing the Cerro Grande in 2000. This is showing the La Mesa fire in 1977. This is showing the Dome Fire 1996. This is showing the San Miguel Fire 2009. And then we had Cerro Grande, we had Los Conchas. And so seeing multiple fires over the same area, we've seen this game before. This is not new. And so our, our actions are not necessarily reactive, but they're also proactive because we know this is gonna come again into the same area. This is Coach T. So even though uh, the Dixon App Orchard may have been on the, the news and the media, but our lives at Coach T were at were threatened. This is with a two-inch rainfall, I'm sorry, three-inch rainfall in the Upper Canyon of Peralta. And this was after the fire. And so the flooding events are nothing new to our community. And this is a real event. This is not a figurative or a possibility. This is what happened. More water came down our canyon than is in the real ground itself. And so it was building that department, that the building the capabilities, the forestry aspect, the hazardous fuels, the wireland firefighting for initial attack, the search and rescue, and as well as restoration for habitat enhancement of how can we complement the ongoing restoration efforts that are happening in our backyard. And so we started building this, uh, building our relationships with the Forest Service to uh, have an MOU signed. So it's not just uh, Ruben Montes calling from the Forest Service, hey, how's it going? But it's setting up the stage for having to meet quarterly and, and, and being realistic about our goals and as well as sitting at the table as equals. Um, and so then that brings in New Mexico Energy and Minerals Natural Department to do an MOU with their department as well. 
This also led to doing activities that we didn't necessarily have funding for, but we wish to do. And so that's where US Fish and Wildlife Service came in. And so we built the first ever Tribal Youth Conservation Corps at Coach T. And we also teamed up with the Partners for Wildlife out of US Fish and Wildlife Service. So that got us in tune with other uh, refuges in New Mexico, like uh, Bosque del Apache, uh, Vial de Oro. And so being that water is really the springboard to all these conversations, it was essential to build this EPA 106 water quality program. And so we hired a water quality specialist. And so instead of having a snapshot in time for a baseline study, we would now be sampling water uh, so that we can see trends. And then what this is gonna lead to is uh, treatment as a state. Uh, as we get treatment as a state, then we can move to 319 to non-point source contamination, which goes up the river towards Los Alamos, as well as Bandelier. Uh, it wasn't enough to just monitor our water, but we wanted to monitor the rangeland so that we can have a carry capacity idea for uh, what kind of biodiversity can we afford to uh, um, to support and foster that development. But because there's uh, many aspects to um, the NEPA the NEPA process, and, and as as we're having relationships with our neighbors, and we're starting to um, do uh, credible and viable GPS data maps that, that involve the locations of places of cultural significance. So we needed to have a cultural resource committee to be developed in Coach Team. And that went in line with the Bureau of Reclamation because we wanted to 638 that funding from riparian restoration, habitat enhancement and river, rate, river maintenance. Um, we also started working with Sandoval County uh, to, to make sure that we have a, uh, a workable and viable relationship, not, not an adversary, but how can we complement each other's work? And so that's where we started working, uh, visualizing, well, let's start working with tribes such as Mescalero and Sandia Pueblo to relocate turkeys. And so turkeys are one cultural specific animal that we really love, we, we cherish, we honor, but we didn't have in our backyard. And so that's where we started looking down the road for turkey uh, restoration, bighorn sheep restoration, uh, pronghorn restoration, as well as Rio Grande cutthroats. And so this is the part that I love. My background is wildlife, love wildlife. And so this is where we started seeing the advantages of being in the locality with the backdrop of the Hamas Mountains behind us, the Hamas Cochiti Mountains, which is essentially a genetic pool for wildlife. And so we started uh, monitoring our wildlife, not just uh, by game cameras, but putting establishing water holes, establishing uh, a cold wildlife corridors and so that we could see what the what, what what was using the land and how they were how they were using it. So we started seeing wild feral horses. We started seeing feral uh, cattle, without no brands. But evidently, we're I was ultimately interested in, in the in the large predators like the mountain lion because it's like the keystone species. And so, being that we're monitoring wildlife, we had a good grasp on the population. And so. That led to our, 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 the development of our hunting strategy and the proclamation. And so as I was working at Coach Team, we're developing the survey protocols, the conservation codes, developing the fishing and wildlife management plan because of Coach Team Lake. We're also working with wildlife habitat restoration, community outreach, education, the hunting proclamation. And what I was really shooting for was going above and beyond what Game and Fish is able to provide so that we can best sit at the table with Game of Fish when we start talking about pronghorn reintroduction and or even bringing in uh, mule deer from other locations like at Kaibab where they have way too many mule deer. But it was looking at visually of how can we produce these uh, a land base that is able to be so sustainable but start rehabilitation from these past fires and the, the revising the forest management plan, the list goes on and on. This is a never ending battle and that's the beauty of wildlife. And so going further a little bit, uh, a little bit closer in, it was about the history of the area, the laws and policies, the tribal, the federal and the state, habitat ecosystem management, tribal wildlife uses, species management, culturally significant species, game species, non-game species, 
wildlife collisions, education outreach, integrated resource management plan. And so that's where I started thinking about National Park Service was how can I dovetail our projects with what Scott's doing? Our, our free ranging buffalo, our resident elk herds, and of course, you know, uh, the predators that are there. This is all a coach tee. This is on the Santa Fe River. And so as, uh, as we're working on the Santa Fe River, it started, um, it started with a, a, a seed of thought, if you will, about restoration on the Santa Fe River, about creating a river, the Santa Fe River, if you will, on the Coach Tee Reach to build a fish hatchery or a fish raceway, if you will, to raise um, real grand cutthroats in the future. But evidently, we're wanting to give the advantages for tribal coach tea, tribal community to have the advantages not to hunt. And again, going back to the philosophies of looking at wildlife, wildlife from my grandma and grandpa is not looking at a animal to simply hunt down and kill and put a head on your wall. This is a relative. And so the process for hunting is one to liken to a funeral for your relative. And so as you're bringing the animal back to your, your relative, back to your house, it's like um, creating, it is like uh, having a funeral for your relative. So you place to you know, have a place of culture of a significance in your house, you feed and honor it. You invite your family and the community to come feast. And so there's a larger aspect to this hunting and that's what we're really um, wanting to uh, foster is that uh, the cultural rights, if you will, for our community to continue those. And so this is where I started running against the grain of some of some of the old schoolers because I said that hunting on coach tea is a privilege and not a right. Whereas in the past, it would be a right because you're a tribal member. And so it's sharing with our community members that there was a time frame when there was a lot of animals and a little bit of people. But now we're a, a lot of people and a little bit of animals and fragmentation and habitat and carrying capacity and vegetation and fires and, and all these other factors. And so that's where it started. That's where this is where I started to build a program that would be above and beyond what Game of Fish is able to offer. And so it was one of shooting for elderly hunts, a youth hunt, a, a, and a vast majority of our community started going towards archery hunts, which is awesome because it's a, the mind to do an archery hunt is a little, is a, it's not a little bit, it's a lot different than a rifle hunt. And so this is where I started seeing, um, because we were having a, a lot of poachers coming out of the uh, National Park Service. And whether uh, Scott was there to monitor or whoever was monitoring, we could see that there was hunters, not from Coach T, but from outside coming onto Coach T from the National Park Service because the back area is really a hard area to manage because of the wilderness, the area that is there. And so you have the National, you have the national Forest, you have National Park Service, and you have Coach T. And this overlying jurisdiction threw some curveballs because we would see the hunters come in from 289 Forest Road and they would come out at Coach T and, and they would blatantly be poaching. And then we would be tasked with uh, the regulations and uh, the conservation efforts on Coach T. And so that's where we started getting into conversations with Game of Fish and National Park Service, as well as uh, the Forest Service because of the poaching, not only the poaching, but the illegal timber harvesting that was going on. And also not only the hunting and legal timber harvesting, but also the, the archeological um, devastation that is happening where people would say, we're gonna go for a hike and I know exactly where they're going, they're beelining it. And then we would find digging holes. We would find um, on the walls, etched out marking at our shrines within National Park Service, we would find our shrines desecrated with trinkets and beads and crystals and as our offerings would be tucked to the side. So going back to hunting, it was one of a ge genetic pull of Coach T being able to complement National Evangelier National uh, Park, the monument. Now, so we did release turkeys in Coach T. So we do have turkeys in Coach T now in the Bolski. And so we worked with uh, we worked with Mescalero, we worked with the Wild Turkey Federation, we worked with BIA, we also worked with uh, Santa Ana and Sandia, who also release turkeys. And so we still have our turkey traps at Mescalero. 
Uh, we had two releasing events in Coach T, just adjacent to Coach T uh, reservation for Bighorn Sheep introductions. And it was one of working with Game and Fish and knocking on their door to uh, relocate Bighorn Sheep to Coach T's backyard. And being that Bighorn Sheep were exportated out of the Hamas Coach T mountains since 1800s, but we see evidence of them everywhere, whether it be etched, uh, etched out um, uh, carvings of them, whether they be bones in archaeological sites, um, they were really uh, culturally significant, but now that we have them within our backyard, they're celebrated, and now we have them. It, and so it's tying ourselves back to uh, our ancestral domain, or, or if you will, our, our own critical habitat. As, as an indigenous person, we are threatened, we are endangered, our philosophies are threatened, our way of life is threatened, so therefore uh, I am an, an endangered species a walking jaguar, if you will. So this is a combination of even uh, Corps of Engineers was in on this. Uh, the Forest Service was there, Game and Fish, but we were also, so we we're releasing these bighorn sheep and it was the, the concept of everything for everyone and nothing for ourselves. Because if we had the mindset of, this is mine, me, mine, I would be one sad individual because these animals, these wildlife do not see jurisdictional boundaries. And they did, they traveled to Zia, they traveled to Abiquiu, they traveled to uh, the Northern reaches of the Vast Caldera. And so now this is what is also part of Bandelier's uh, landscape. And so it's a, it, the, the segue of the conversation for partnership and using wildlife as that motor is really a, a potent one because they don't see jurisdictional boundaries. Only us as humans see that, that fence line. And so as we're talking about turkeys, turkeys are there at Coach T. Uh, big horned sheep are now in our mountains behind uh, in our landscape. And so now we're visualizing the prospect for reintroduction and relocating pronghorn to Coach T. And so I, wasn't, I was wanting to start building the capacity of tribal governments uh, tribal wildlife on, on this uh, on this focus because now I can see that we have professionals, we have biologists, hydrologists, geologists, we have the ologists within our natural resource departments, and so it was not so far fetching to work specifically with tribes. Of what can we do in house before we go to the federal government or state to ask for assistance? And so working with Laguna, Sandia, Santa Ana, San Felipe. It was one of building a wildlife tribal wildlife consortium, because what we can see is that the majority of the wildlife corridors, which the New Mexico law now has a, a wildlife corridor act, majority of those wildlife corridors are on tribal lands. And so what I can also see is that the majority of the tribal lands are a Shangri-La, or um, they're a, a place of conservation that is not seen elsewhere. And so now, I want to bring to the table of how to work with the tribal government and not see that as just a checkbox mark to talk to them because of uh, consultation, but but realistically see them as a partner to see them as an equal, sit at the table, not an afterthought. And so Kochi Lake Fish and Wildlife Management was very, it was one awesome jump start because this is the first time that Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service actually work together not adversaries, but partnering. And I'm so grateful that it was Coach T that brought these two people to work together. And so this is a photo of sharing, this is my boat, my boat's bigger than your boat. And so they're sharing what, the, what kind of equipment they use and how they do it. Um, so it was one of a networking possibility for Corps of Engineers, for uh, Game of Fish and uh, US Fish and Wild Service to partner together as well as Coach T. And so this has started working. This has started uh, looking at the Coach T Lake Ecological Resource Team and not just looking at a team, but what can we start doing forward is sampling for radionuclides and using fish as indicator species. And so it was one of taking another leap of looking at Los Alamos and contamination, but it was also looking at using, using the wildlife as indicator species. 
Oh, uh, at this time, at this moment, I had worked there with Mescalero and we were looking for a real grand cutthroats at Santa Clara Pueblo. And so we were electroshocking and then we were also looking for how can we do restoration work in that stream for a real grand cutthroat. And so it started developing this idea of stream restoration for waterfalls and pools and riffles and starting to recreate these meanders but also looking at the vegetation because we need that vegetation to um, provide the insects. But we're also looking at stream health. So we're looking at the benthic macroinvertebrates. But we were not also, we were not just looking at fish, but we're looking at turkey food because we wanted turkeys to be there. We want them to stay. So we want to provide the food for them. So it was not just one species, but it was looking at biodiversity and ultimately ec ecology. So as we're looking at uh, Coach T, we're looking at Santa Clara Pueblo, well, reflecting back to when I used to be a fish biologist at Mescalero, it was now walking into these canyons and finding the devastation after a fire. And so we were started looking at Coach T's ancestral domain. And what I mean by domain, ancestral domain, is that we're, we're, we outlined cultural villages, shrines, springs, mountains, Places of cultural uh, places of collection for minerals and plants and wildlife, and so that began the foundation for our map of our ancestral domain and essentially our critical habitat. It was not enough just to talk about the map or how significant it was, but I wanted to find out what was happening in these canyons. So instead of GIS, USGS coming and say this land is hydrophobic, there's no water, there's no vegetation growing here. I wanted to find out for ourselves. So I, I didn't want to be lied to in a language I didn't understand, nor have my village be lied to in a language we didn't understand. And so that's where we had we had we came across a high water mark who has a geologist. We have a hydrologist that walking with us, uh, myself as a biologist. And so we started walking down these canyons and doing our, our own assessment. And so that's where we started uh, formulating uh, what our envision would be for the future for stream restoration, for canyon restoration, for restoration of our, of our habitat, the mountains that, are, that provided our supermarket from time immemorial. And so that's where we started looking at not just native species, but started looking at food sovereignty because uh, we wanted to look at possibly you know, planting vegetation that will be able to sustain people, planting apple trees, <laughs> cherry trees, apricots, plum trees, so that it starts speaking towards uh, um, food sovereignty and how are we gonna sustain in this ever-changing world? And so started thinking about providing food for people, for our community, for um, the future. And so what we found at the top of the watershed, so I showed you flooding events in the past. This is where the flooding events started. This is at the top of the watershed in, near the Valles Caldera. And lo and behold, it blows my mind still of why there's continued mismanagement of Forest Service. Yes, I said it, because we're finding cows in there, continually to continuously using the area for livestock grazing when we know for damn sure that there's flooding events at Coach Team. And because those flooding events started is because there's no vegetation. So why would you allow cows to be in there? And not just have cows in there, but way too many cows. So if this area is looking at re restoration and habitat, then why do we continuously to continue with a method and strategy that we know is not right? Like Einstein said, why are, we cannot use the same thinking that got us into the mess in the first place, right? So that's where traditional ecological knowledge comes to play because the traditional ecological knowledge is not knowledge of the past, is knowledge of the future. So we're looking at stream restoration and this is a, an area that burn through slightly and so but but we can see that the stream is not healthy because there's black flies in there and we didn't see we didn't see the bento, benthic macroinvertebrates that would be necessary to sustain a viable fish population because there's no coverage and so we can see where this was happening and we could see this happening in every other canyon all the way up to water canyon and so we did walk into Frijoles Canyon to do assessments. We did also do Kaplan Canyon because Kaplan Canyon is for National Park Service, in, I'm sorry, for the Forest Service into National Park Service to Coach Team. And so this is where the 
Guti Ecological Project came into light. And so we started doing the youth, doing the, the youth development to be able to build that educational ladder. And so not simply doing a summer program, but what we're, what we're looking at was building an educational ladder to have high school students team up with college students so that the college students are given the monitor, giving the, the mentoring, the tutoring, if you will, but also giving the students the ability to see beyond high school and the possibilities of going to college, not if they go to college, but when they go to college. And so this educational ladder was, what, what it produced was 90% of our youth who went through our program went on to get their master's in natural resources and conservation. So Ariel, uh, she went to Colorado State University. She has her, now her master's. Uh, Victoria Grace Atencio also got her master's in wildlife. Uh, Daniel Bird, who's now at Mo Montana University of Montana, and he's doing his uh, PhD in wildlife. Uh, Xavier Lavato is also at University of Montana going into wildlife. And so this educational ladder is something that was something that we saw with the SCEP program, the Forest Service, but we what that's what we wanted to replicate at the tribal level. This was our first attempt at it. So we had three programs, one at Coach T, Tsuki, and Santa Ana. Then we had another pro that same program occur. Oh, sorry, this is when the government shut down. And so when the government shut down, we teamed up with River Source Incorporated. And so that's where we hired two college students and then we hired a, a high school student to team up with them. In 2014, I didn't want it to be just isolated to coach these students. I wanted it to be for indigenous students who are sincerely interested in natural resource management. And so I was envisioning a, a natural resource academy, if you will. And so what I was wanting them to do was spend time with us five weeks with intensive training and then go on to work with the Game and Fish, Forest Service, uh, National Park Service, if they had availability or, or natural resource management with myself at Coach T. So we were not all just doing wildlife. We started working with medicinal plant research as well because the medicinal plants were tied to archaeological sites. And so as we're working with archaeological sites, that took us back to places of our past and our migrational pattern, which went to back, back to Duane, which is in Bandelier. Bandelier is the northernmost border of Coach T. So Duane is not a Tewa village. And so there's speculation about if Duwini or Frijoles Canyon being Tewa, it is not a Tewa village. Duwini is not gonna be found in the Tewa language because it is a Karis word. Duwini is a crouching. And so Duwini is the real term for Duwini. And Duwini is referring to Duwini Mukach, which is the stone lions. So the Stone Lions district is not talking about the village itself, it's talking about the district of Tiwini. And so that's why we, I guess, so we continuously uh, reinforce that Tiwini, Freolos Canyon, up to Water Canyon are Karis villages and not Tewa villages. So Karis language program, so we, we wanted to make sure that our language programs were not uh, sitting in the classroom, regurgitating the same uh, things over and over. And so that's where the idea for the outdoor classroom and pulling them out of the classroom to do uh, seeding, to plant trees, and still continue on with the rigors of language immersion. And so the step on beyond the, the rigors of uh, curriculum for Keras language was showing them how to make an arrow, how to flint nap, how to make a bow, how to make a shinny. And evidently finding these materials took us back to the mountains within our ancestral domain. And so it was effectively reconnecting ourselves with our ancestral domain. And so that spoke towards cultural uh, resistance or cultural persistence. And so not just talking to them and telling them, but making them do it themselves so that that seed of thought would be with them so that when they have children, their children would be able to be, have that same knowledge and so there was that transfer of knowledge that we're uh, seeking. And so where to find, find the obsidian and how to flake it. And so we were not simply talking about obsidian, but we're also talking about the oak that were there and seeing the stages of what. So there was evidently, like, what happened to these trees? Well, there's a fire that came through. And then they started growing again. 
but then an, another fire came through. And so you can see the timeline on the landscape. And that was a good talking point to talk to our young ones. But also it was talking to them where to find onions, where to find these raw materials, where to find the flint so that they can, these young little boys could show their kids in the future and not just show them where to find it, show them how to make it and the process to make it. It was one of wanting to tear apart the, the ideas of philosophies that are not our own because those the philosophies of me, myself, and I, they, it really has to go out the window. And so what our grandmas and grandpas talk about is we and us. It's always we and us. There's no me, myself, and I. There is no pedestal to be sitting on. It's, a, it's we and us, the concept. And so tribes also no, unknowingly inherit accepted some of these nuances to philosophies that are not our own. And so that's what really, in my mind, that's what stopped tribes working collaboratively with each other because it's Coach TM and we're better than everybody else. And then it's Santa Clara, heck with everybody else, we're better than everybody else. And so what I was wanting to do was say, San Domingo and Coach T, we're the same people, we're one people. Let's bridge our programs. And so this is San Domingo and Coach T together with our language programs, working together. And so it's not, it's not about color of skin. It's not about gender. It's not about race. It's about humanity. And that's what we're shooting for, was seeing that commonality between human beings and how we can work together. Instead of seeing the jurisdictional boundaries, seeing race and gender, always looking for a difference to say that we're different rather than seeing looking at the commonalities of how can what do we what do we share in common and yet let's use that as our common denominator and so this is where we started thinking about stream restoration and this was really the precursor to us working with bandelier with national forest because we're interested in population management we're interested in water quality we're a language in we're interested in perpetuating our culture through language. And so the outdoor uh, classroom for animal names, plant names, but also the native vegetation, the scientific names even, and how to clone, how to regenerate wills and cottonwoods for restoration, which I'm sure that many people are interested in when they start talking about beaver restoration, like Santa Clara, like Scott. So we're also interested in stream ecology and having those discussions. There is no limit to the end of these topics because we're talking about fishing, hunting, planting, even how to tie a string for fishing, what can, bait can be used. And so we were wanting to use the idea of Montessori to do the, the multi-generational education so that grandma and grandpa could be there with their grandchild still learning science, still learning physics, still learning geometry, but evidently we're looking at stream restoration because in, in this area, um, it was really hit by cows and cattle and mismanagement. The same exact things that we could see in the upper canyons because of the cattle that the forest service allowed to graze, it looked like this. And so it was not just doing a demonstration in Coach T on the Santa Fe River. It was creating the demonstration of this is what we want to do. This is how we can do it. And using the, using the advantages of um, um, using the, letting the stream do the work, the Bill Zeig method, right? The Bill Zeig method was using the natural materials, the rocks, the willows, the trees to induce meandering. And so it limited the amount of cost that was we're looking at. We didn't want to build concrete weirs. We didn't want to build rock weirs. We wanted to use the vegetation that was already there. We wanted to use the willows. We wanted to use cottonwoods. We wanted to use the rocks. So it was natural as possible. And so this is where we started doing stream restoration on the Santa Fe River. And so we started working with US Fish and Wildlife Service because we wanted to build a fish passage project so that we can demonstrate to, to Scott we wanted to demonstrate to National Park Service. We wanted to demonstrate to everybody who was interested in stream restoration, this is what we can do together, is build a fish passage project so that it complements a road, but also it speaks towards fish habitat. 
And so this is a project that we worked on and not necessarily just doing it just to do it, but we're interested in creating a stream that only had native fish in it, a real grand cutthroat, a real grand sucker. And so that's what the fish that we're really shooting for. So all the exotic species we, we chucked out of that stream. And so this stream only had native fish in it. And so it was wanting to show a demonstration to Forest Service. This is what we want to do in the upper, upper canyons. Not a, and we don't want to be an afterthought. We want to be part of the project. We want to be on the ground doing the planning. We want to be on the ground doing the project alongside of your staff. These are our students that were part of our youth program. This is one of uh, two, um, sorry, yeah, two stream structures that we did. And so we have a ring facility on Coach T. And so this started speaking to another uh, avenue of Santa Fe River because the city of Santa Fe was deliberately building a plan to pipeline all the water out of Santa Fe River below Santa Fe back to Buckman for return flow credits for Santa Fe. And not, they didn't even consider La Bajara, La Cienega, La Cieneguilla, Coach T, or San Domingo as end users on the Santa Fe River. So it was one of trying to tell Santa Fe, the city of Santa Fe, we have a rearing facility that raises Rio Grande cutthroats on the Santa Fe River at Coach T. What do you not understand? And so that started speaking towards what if we can produce the Rio Grande cutthroats at Coach T to complement the restoration projects uh, within Bandelier. And so the, we were not just doing it by ourselves. This was a, a developing collaboration of people who are all interested on the same common goals and common aspirations. It was Coach T. Pueblo, it was Corps of Engineers, Santa Fe Indian School. The, the amount of people who are willing to collaborate is immense. It's just finding those people and making the connection to make a viable and workable relationship. So this is Coach T and this, we, we were getting fish from Alchesay Williams Creek in Arizona. So we were also working with my White Mountain Apache tribe. So this is not thinking locally, this is thinking regionally. And so we got some of our equipment from the US Fish and Wildlife Service and we're just trying to do what we could with little to no funding. And we're using, we're also cloning native, uh, native plants. And so this is where our, we started monitoring the fish in our, in our river through small, uh, small fish surveys. We're also looking at what Zuni Pueblo is doing because we wanted to see what other tribes are doing so that they're engaging uh, the wildlife in a meaningful manner. And so we're also working with high watermark for storm gauges because like the flooding events I showed, I wanna know when I need to run. Um, it was not a matter of if the floodings were coming, it was when, and our lives were at stake. Uh, we were also well-versed in Benthic Macro, and so we started working with other tribes. And so our staff, our students were uh, teaching and working with other uh, staff and students from other schools and other uh, tribes. And so we were also looking at beaver restoration. So we started um, wrapping our trees with pig wire because the beavers were chewing through the through the poultry fences. And so that's where we were doubling the wires and we, we wanted the beavers to stay. So we left some trees untouched. We didn't wrap all the trees. And so the regeneration of a falling cottonwood in the initial is really devastating. It's like, oh man, they knocked down that big tree. But when you see the regeneration, it's like a, hundreds of baby trees popped out of that one tree that fell. So it was one of, let's, see, let's let that happen. Let's let that ecological process happen. So let the beavers do their work. And so it was not just working for stream restoration, but it was also on water quality because warm water doesn't allow for oxygen. You're not gonna find the same fish in, in warm water. And so we wanted to produce a cold water uh, using the Rio Grande cutthroat as the talking point because of the parameters for the Rio Grande cutthroat, cold water, quality water. Kai T, I'm, I'm gonna, um, in, I have to interrupt. Okay. Um, you really brought, you've given us like so many things to think about and you, you brought us to where, um, Scott has really, you know, picked up and, and shared with the trout and the beaver. And so you've sort of brought, brought us this nice, um, full circle. 
Um, but since we've gone over time, oh, um, man. if you just want to, yeah, finish up and then I'm going to okay. ask Gregor to just um, have okay. the last word. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to fast forward here. Uh, some have uh, plenty of pictures to share. This is the end result of planting from the students. This is planting from us. This is also inducing waterfalls, pools, riffles, and waterfalls. And so we do have uh, trout in our mouth, in our waters from one from a dilapidated to seeing the change over time. And so it was one also working with the, the National Park Service. But one, one thing I want to really point out was this area right here, this is the focal point for the East Hamas, I'm sorry, the Southwest Hamas landscape restoration, which I, which I really felt was a, was a folly because the fires didn't happen on this side, they happened on this side. And what I thought was bananas that was all the restoration was happening on, on the West side but nothing was being happening on the east side. So that's where we started working with the Nature Conservancy. That's where we started teaming up with Scott to do stream restoration. And so it was one of, you know, wanting to connect ourselves to the landscape. And so even though we have Coach T Reservation, that, that's, not, that's not encompassing a Coach T land base. And so uh, Jose Hilario had also had actually been taken by the Coach T governor to Bandelier. And so after Bandelier had saw Coach T's boundaries, that's when Bandelier had uh, hijacked Coach T ancestral domain. So this is the map that we had developed to be able to show our neighbors, our land base that we are sincerely interested in conserving and preserving as our critical habitat. Without, deliver, without divulging or sharing cultural knowledge or sacred sites, we could share this with National Park Service, with all the entities that encompass the land base that we are, that is the heart. If it, and if you can see, Bandelier is at the heart of Coach T's ancestral domain. And so this was, you know, through Manifest Destiny, those ideas, this land was stolen from Coach T. And so it's looking at land base, not just about land, but looking at the, at the universe and our ties in the universe to this land base. That we were not walking people who, act, who just like the spot. That Coach T is specifically located to the point that it's on the star constellation. If you overlap the Canis Major on top of tribal, gov tribal locations, you will find an overlapping map of our tribes and their locations. And so, Archaeologists love that. Why, why Chaco Canyon? Why way out there? Well, that's the star serious if you overlap it with the known uh, communities. So then you can see why Coach T is so significant that it speaks to walking out towards Chaco Canyon. And then from Coach T itself, the Coach T itself does not have a sundial like Chaco, Chaco Canyon. Coach T is the sundial. So Titia Peak is a summer solstice. La Cienega is the equinox and the, our, the volcano on the far right as you're entering Santa Fe is our winter solstice. So Kochi doesn't have a sundial. Kochi is a sundial. How many communities on the face of the planet have that as a, looking at the landscape and situated to that same specific? Machu Picchu, Stonehenge, Chaco Canyon, Kochi. This is old Kochi. This is where DeVargas blatantly attacked Coach T. Coach T is the only village to counterattack and regain captives. And that's why Coach T is Coach T and not San Buenaventura village like San Domingo, San Felipe, Santa Ana, Santa Clara, San I. Is because of this. And this is where DeVar this is where Coach T uh, counterattacked and the Spanish left the area and didn't return. So Coach T didn't have a uh, didn't have a mission. And so thus we didn't. Uh, where does Coach T? This is Coach T. And so just adjacent to National Park Service. And so we do visit, those are our footprints in those mountains. We do hike into Capulin Canyon. We do hike into Frills Canyon. We do walk into the Stone Lions area. And those are our people. Those are our villages. And we continue to maintain those trails by walking them and reconnecting ourselves. And there's also Ruben Montes with us. And so this is a, if you can imagine the landscape behind was a mixed conifer forest before the fires and life will persist. So we do our collections. We are, we are way in the mountains. We're doing a places for a pottery collection. 
for clay. So we 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 are in these mountains, and so there there used to be jaguars in there. Um, there's places of cultural significance. I apologize, Forest Service, but I thought it was funny. The property, Coach T, Forest, and always and forever. And so we are with reflections of our ancestors, and they left us some building blocks. And we are a living uh, living culture. We are, and so when they're talking about National Park Service, it it if it, it, it uh, bothers me a little bit because when I see Glacier National Park, I see Yosemite National Park, I see Yellowstone National Park, but I I don't see the Indigenous peoples, and is it frightens me because of Senator Heinrich's proposal to redesignate Bandelier to a national park. Zion National Park saw 3.5 million people in one summer. Bandelier last spring break was already at full capacity. I do not see how a bandolier can manage 3.5 million people, nor can the tribes, nor can the mountains sustain the amount of people that is expected to utilize the area as a national park. And so I, I blatantly oppose Senator Heinrich's proposal to redesignate bandolier to a national park. But yeah, thank you for the time. I thank you for the opportunity. And if there's any questions, uh, I'll put my uh, contact in the, e in the email. So if there's any further questions down the line, uh, please contact me at any time. Um, I'm willing and able, um, just contact me. Uh, I, I love talking about these topics. Um, yeah, thank you for the time, young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, especially for the this sort of celestial perspective, um, as well as bringing us sort of into the present day. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, Gregor, I'm gonna give the last word to you sort of thinking as the sort of um, person who's ushered Rad sort of into the world and thinking of this perspective that Kaiti has offered. Thank you, Catherine. And um, thank you, Kai T. Uh, um, I've heard about you, Kai T, from Scott for a long time, and it's nice to e-meet you. Um, turning to all our attendees at the opening, I said that the, the talks that would follow would give a very vivid picture of the realities uh, that I was alluding to. And I think Kai T's detailed deep dive into Coach T Pueblo and its leadership in this realm uh, kind of right, bears out what I'm saying as much as Darren's and Abe's and Nick's as well. Um, I'll, I'll just say a few things to kind of wrap us up here. Uh, the first is that I'll just share an anecdote quickly. Um, we've had fires, which I alluded to in, in my opening presentation, the mountains above us. They have impacts on our rivers and our waters as well. A, a couple of months ago, I was I took my, my eight-year-old son to the edge of the river just to see what a chocolate brown river full of sediment looks like, just to understand those impacts. And he caught a fish, or he almost did, on the side of the water, and he was delighted about that. And then we realized the whole edge of the river was lined with fish, putting their mouths out of the water trying to breathe. And uh, we went from a moment of his childish delight to, oh my God, we're seeing a fish kill. And uh, he kept saying, what can we do? Right, Dad, what can we do? And there was nothing we could do in that moment. And it felt horrible. And it suddenly made all of this blabbing on webinars real to me in a different way and kind of obvious, but it's just me and my kid in that reality. And, uh, you know, personal resolutions to work with others and collaborate in watershed protection and those kinds of things, all the kinds of illustrations Scott and Kai T and others are showing us. Um, but it made me realize we can do very little on our own. Right, the value of collaboration, uh, like Kai T and others are communicating here. Um, but then in that collaboration, if we can get ahead of these things, or if we can even see value in impacted systems like Kai T and, and Scott are showing us, right, where agencies may turn their lands on impacted lands, but people who've been there for 10,000 years know we have to do something. Um, to see human creativity, to see cultural revitalization emerging from a landscape experiencing uh, climate change driven negative impacts is really inspiring, right? If we can do something in, in that 100,000 acre charred landscape 
And if we can restore culture and we can strategically, not everywhere, not in every way, but strategically restore past elements that are important to us, if we can preserve things that matter in the right places, uh, that's a lot of hope. And if we can build hope out of these really difficult situations, it ought to inspire all of us to try and get out of the head of the curve and be proactive before we suffer these impacts. Get out ahead of this, tap into our, our indigenous colleagues and fellow citizens understanding of the world, use that power, work with it, allow them to lead us. Um, so that's what I'm seeing here. More broadly than this, I think I'll just reflect that this is a conversation, you've had four or five speakers, we each have unique perspectives and backgrounds and where we're headed and histories of collaboration or not. There's so many other voices and I feel like we don't have a tidy story here where you put these four talks together and boom, here's the puzzle. So many strands and pieces and room for people who've just been participants as observers today to lend their voices and carry this message further and do your own thing with this. So I guess I don't have a nice tidy wrap up other than the importance of collaboration and the importance of creativity and the possibility of making progress and finding hope, even in really difficult circumstances. And with that, ultimately, uh, the importance of continuing to talk and meet like this and share ideas and learn from each other. So thanks for everybody who stuck in uh, for this slightly longer than anticipated uh, symposium, but it's been really stimulating for me and I hope uh, the same goes for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor, and all of our speakers today. Really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, we will send a follow-up email with a recording. Do send your questions and notes to Emma Albee um, and stay tuned for follow-up sessions. This is not certainly not the end, but definitely feels like the beginning of a conversation. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>